Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm just here to give uh, one of those regular updates on my own thinking about um, graduate TAs thinking about their own teaching, both in how they talk about teaching and uh, how they teach and what we see them do when they teach. So um, I'm going to be using some slightly newish language today. Um, I'll be building off some of the work you've seen me present previously, um, but this is kind of based off some recent thinking I've been doing, talking to people, reading papers, and um, kind of trying some things out here. So um, what I'd like to do for at least the first half here is um, present some of my current thinking on this research uh, to you, get some feedback, uh, talk about it. Um, I've got a video uh, for the, toward the end, um, where we can watch together and I'll talk about how um, I'm thinking about and analyzing this video and how it relates to how this TA um, talks about teaching. We can talk about that. And um, at the end or along the way, uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, any of this or answer questions. Um, uh, so any feedback you have would be very helpful. Uh, just to remind you kind of what I'm, the source of data that I'm drawing from here, uh, I've conducted uh, interviews with 18 uh, graduate physics TAs, um, eight of these for whom we've conducted uh, video uh, recordings. These are all in uh, physics tutorial environments, both physics one and physics two. Um, we have five TAs uh, videotaped in 1120, that's physics two, six TAs in physics one and some supplementary data from uh, surveys uh, with these TAs in earlier semesters. And um, field notes, um, I hang out at these uh, weekly meetings for, to prepare TAs and LH release courses, so I jot down some notes and observations. Um, so this is just some supplementary data. Uh, I've color-coded uh, most of these TAs that I've started uh, combing through the data on. So we've got very colorful uh, code names. Um, I'll be referring to one, at least one of those uh, later. Um, graduate TAs in re transformed environments uh, are under increased demand um, and have expanded expectations than those in traditional environments. These are to be attentive to student reasoning, engage students in Socratic type dialogue, and generally facilitate uh, student discussion uh, rather than just being at the board and uh, presenting physics content. However, we don't really have uh, ongoing support for TAs in this role. Uh, in the absence of a LA program like course, uh, TAs are left to learn by going out and teaching and doing it. So, no. Did you have a, yeah, I have a question, yeah. but sorry to interrupt. Do you mind? Okay. Okay. I mean, and this is just sort of a framing, since you put framing on your title slide in there. <laughs> Recently, there's been sort of bantering discussion going around on the Phys Learner List Serve about the absence of importance of instructor practice or variation. I, there's this AJP article that makes the, that claim. I sort of think that's bollocks. Um, you anyway. sort of think what? What? You sort of think what? It, oh, I think that the claim that the teachers don't matter is bollocks. Bollocks? <laughs> Absurd. Doesn't oh. matter. Oh. Um, pollocks. <laughs> um, no. Another word I've like, never heard right. before. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, this is just, it, it strikes me that one response to this, you know, saying is the instructional role, all you need to do is put them in the right pedagogical environment and the right things will happen. Well, How do you respond to that? Uh, I'll let you know in a couple of years. <coughs> okay. Uh, you already have a sense of that. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. So that's, that's one uh, outcome of this research is what happens when you put TAs in an environment like this? Do they learn? Um, to engage in these types of behaviors um, simply by, you know, being, you know, rearranging the classroom so students are facing each other instead of from the board um, and 
the nature of the, the inquiry based nature of the materials. So um, it's upon it's it's uh, upon us to um, look into these environments and see what's actually going on. So um, most of you have seen any talks by me have seen a similar diagram like this. I'm just going to kind of give an overview. Um, so previously I've identified two um, classes of beliefs, and these come from Natasha Spears' work with mathematics TDs, um, enacted and professed beliefs, professed beliefs which are emergent from uh, uh, interviews. These are beliefs that could be categorized from what, how TAs talk, um, and active beliefs what they do in the classroom. Um, so previously I've been looking for coordination between um, beliefs that are expressed in an interview context <coughs> and those that are um, could be inferred by observing a TA in a classroom. Um, what I'd like to do to, today is sort of um, put more focus on the actual context of the environment and move toward a description where we're not really talking about two different types of uh, we'll talk about what we want to call them beliefs or not, but types of specialized um, ideas about teaching that may be apparent from two different contexts or both. Okay, so um, this is, you know, I'm, we're moving toward a resource like uh, model. Um, so Joe Ranch is talking about epistemological resources um, of students and instructors. So um, this is kind of what I'm moving toward. I'm not hesitant to call it that yet, but, but um, a step down from um, uh, kind of beliefs which have a connotation of um, uh, more structure than I'd like to kind of put onto these kind of resources that teachers are drawing from that are activated um, in making decisions in the classroom when talking about. Um, this kind of follows on the path, so I think in previous presentations or uh, uh, papers I talked about how we can approach um, how teach, uh, physics graduate teachers um, think about their teaching in the same way that we examine how physics students think about learning physics. Um, it's well agreed upon at this point that physics students don't come in with fully developed conceptions of what mass is, what velocity, what density are, but neither do they come in completely devoid of any ideas about these things. They, they, they're entering the physics classroom with about 20 years of experience living in the world. Um, in the same way, uh, graduate TAs uh, don't have robust belief structures that guide their um, actions and decisions in the classroom, but neither are they blank slates that are devoid of any about teaching and learning. They've been participants in, in uh, structured education uh, for over a decade, so they have an idea of what um, teaching and learning feel like or, or are to them, at least in the environments that they've had experience with. Um, so this is kind of what I'm getting to when I'm talking about the resources that uh, these instructors are drawing from. Uh, what ideas they have about what teaching and learning are, uh, what uh, it means to know, and where knowing comes from, uh, or where I'm going. Um, these resources are going to affect how an instructor frames um, any sort of instructional activity, like uh, a physics tutorial. Um, so, uh, framing is used to talk about as, uh, at least by uh, Tannen, as an individual group's tacit answer to what is it that's going on in this situation. Um, it uh, involves a set of expectations that are brought to bear um, in that social situation. And it's going to influence both um, what the individual is attentive to, what they notice, what they pay attention to, and how they respond, what they do, and how they react um, in that situation. And so um, in the environments I'm looking at, it's going to be what a graduate teaching assistant is attentive to, notices, and how they respond to student questions, um, 
what is sort of what's involved in the dialogue, um, how they respond to you know anything that happens within the city. So, for example, uh, physics tutorial could be framed as many different things. Uh, for instance, it's completing a workbook. All I have to do is fill in the answers, and once I've got something written in every blank, um, I'm done. I, I should stress that these could be framing brought to bear by uh, either the students or uh, the instructor themselves. And you think all these apply to 1120? Like, all, all these are things that, not just about tutorials in general, but specifically about 1120? Are tutorials, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, well, I mean, is this upper division tutorial? Oh, I see. Things like that. Like, is this a just about the tutorial here. So but my research is solely on the introductory physics tutorials, yeah. but you're right, we could talk about any number of similar... Uh, okay, well I just wondered if that workbook was, was referring to. Oh yeah, so it doesn't, yeah, it, the, the OS tutorials are workbooks, that's what yeah. I said that. Um, your mileage and theory. Uh, it could also be a, a guide towards some um, conceptual end. Um, this is actually how uh, many TAs talk about the tutorials as being some sort of uh, guide. Um, they ask the right questions to get the student toward um, the desired conceptual understanding. Or it could be a situation in which uh, a student is expected to learn from the expert, in this case, the graduate TA. Um, I'll show them how to think. I'll, I'll model my own reasoning. Or it could be a common space to share and discuss ideas. And in each of these four situations, an instructor or a student is going to be attentive to different things and is going to respond in different ways. And this, these frames may shift over the course of a, a classroom period, over the course of an interaction, um, uh, even when the te teaching assistant isn't there. Um, Rachel Scherr has done uh, papers on when frames shift when just students are talking with one another. Um, but I'll be focusing on when uh, situations in which the graduate teaching system is present. Um, so I've already kind of alluded um, to this, but um, in these environments, who's involved in framing the nature of the activity? Um, and I'll open this up to you guys. I already talked about the uh, teaching assistant who's present and the students. But who else has influence in how this activity is put? Should we take a moment to talk or should we start blasting out? Uh, you can blast out. I don't know if he's there. Except you don't get to go first. Well, <laughs> damn it! It's on change. I'll have to bleep that. It wasn't pointing. It's summer. Isn't it summer? <laughs> it's it's casual food. Yeah. Yeah, so um, who friends is that good? It's a great question. I mean, so I, I was just wondering what role the, like the, the head and instructor for the course place is doing the lectures and like, like what kind of attitudes they have. Because I, I recently heard just a conversation about upper division tutorials yeah. being evaluated in a negative light based on an instructor's perception of what was happening in the lower division yeah. tutorials. Mm -hmm. um, so so that, was, that was one I had in mind is, is the actual course instructors, whether or not they uh, are conversing with the teaching assistants, for, for instance, the lead instructor in these courses is the one um, lecturing students and may or may not connect what's going on in lecture with what they have done or are about to do in the tutorial context. In which case the framing becomes a waste of time. Is, is this, does this matter to Unconnected you? to the class. So that's one possible influence on student framing. tell how might a learning assistant's framing be different than a teaching assistant's framing? How about the students? Oh, I, yeah, so students, I, I guess I said they come in, but... Uh. Um, so well, the LA is there for a different type of job than the TA, so... Sure. Um, 
so I think that influences the frame they bring in the class. Right. A specific frame. Um, situation for group work. Or an, or an, an opportunity for group work. Yeah. I think it's a more common frame than for an LA and a TA. Yeah. I mean, um, learning assistants, uh, we would expect to have more of a buy-in to what the goals of the tutorial are because they're selected based on um, not only their performance in the course, but based on an interview where we take them out of the section and ask them how they engage with their peers in that environment. So they are selected based on uh, desirable uh, responses about the nature of the activity itself. So what are the official differences in job description between LA and TA? Like, is the TA responsible for grading and the LA is not, or are there like? Uh, I don't know if you will find a explicit job description anywhere, but you're right. The graduate students are involved in grading, and the or, or yeah, the, the teaching assistants are involved in grading, whereas the learning assistants aren't. And beyond that, beyond no that, that um, it's up to the individual instructors who. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you think you're gonna have to assign a grade to performance. Like, right? Yeah. So it may be a different type of relationship between these two different structures. For, you know. and that's not uniformly true across departments. Mm -hmm. There are some departments where LA is involved in grading. Although I see ones I know of, the LA role in grading is relevant. Okay. Uh, they sometimes they sometimes participate in grading exams, but right. it's still not part of their relationship with the students. Okay. There are some departments where the LA does have, but the same exact grading issues as a, as a TA would have in the physics department. Um, so there are, and then there are other departments, typically those same departments where an LA has zero. So that's an interesting point. There may be a difference in perception or perceived relationship uh, between uh, the student and either the LA or the TA based on whether this person is involved in evaluating my performance in the course. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about? Yeah, I, I think like social conditioning, it plays a very large role in, fr in, in the way we end up accidentally framing these environments. So. It's kind of the, the way the institution is played out over time okay. seems to really be influencing like the way I the way all of us just assume it's gonna take place rather than thinking like, wow, there could be a totally different way this can happen, <clears throat> you know, that education can happen. And I, I just think that uh, that necessarily it's like almost like we relive history constantly, as as uh, as uh, Michael Cole says, you know, okay. we're always taking history and slapping it in front of us and making it our future. Okay. And uh, it seems like that has a huge and uh, almost impenetrable uh, influence on the way we end up doing things, so framing things. Not even, not even a particular individual, but the kind of well, societal me, development of the educational system. Not only the educational system, I think that's uh, by and large, absolutely, but also very specific, specifically to talk to Valerie's. Point, the tutorials themselves, I think that oh, no. the framing of mm. what that space is about used to be very different. The first couple times that we ran tutorials, I think you would have gotten different results for your study that you're engaged right. in. But now that that space has for five years been dedicated to tutorials, people know that that's the history that you're supposed to project onto what's happening next. As opposed to, I come into this space and I know, oh, this is where I copy down homework problems. Great point. Interesting. Anything else? Um, so I just want to take a minute to think. So I've talked a lot uh, in the past about teaching assistant beliefs, and now kind of moving more toward this uh, finer grained uh, resources model. Um, so I just want to kind of uh, talk about how I am thinking about the difference between these. 
Um, these are coming from um, Hammy and Ham Ham Hammer and Elfie's work, um, wherein uh, beliefs are reflective of stable and locally coherent networks of resources that are activated. Uh, and by stable, um, maybe in multiple ways. Uh, one of which is stable based on uh, the local context. That is, for example, um, a TA might behave um, after teaching a certain way after teaching in tutorials uh, for several weeks. But if I take them out of that environment and have them teach a different section or teacher review section without uh, the local kind of structure or without an associated tutorial, they go back to teaching at the board. Uh, whereas, so the, the stability of um, these resources are tied to the local context. Um, or it could be deliberate. It's a, it's a deliberate choice made by an individual to adopt a, pr a particular uh, network uh, or, or belief structure. Or over time, uh, repeated use uh, causes a particular um, structure uh, of resources to Could you say more, just distinguish, I sorry to derail you. Okay. I'm supposed to know all this already, but I'm pretending that I don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can you distinguish a little bit more here on contextual versus structural? Okay. Um, I mean, so is this just really a temporal difference that they're talking about? I think so. Um, I, I think the difference might be uh, to use the example um, I used before, if it takes somebody out of a certain environment and places them in another, um, the difference might be in structural is whether that um, structural stability would be if it persists when I, when I take them and put them it's in. It's as though the structural is contained within the individual and contextual depends on the environment? Maybe. Okay. Um, I don't know, my take would be that structural is something that's imposed by the outside, whereas context is what's going on in the moment in the interactions. Um, I mean, um, those are your words, right? Those are your interpretations? No. I, I think, I mean, we have to read so your paper. I, I think the, uh, yeah. I, I can give you the link, and it's yeah. in our content. But um, I think deliberate is about the individual's personal decision. Uh, contextual is about external cueing and environment. So uh, I, I would have to think it's actually, uh, I'm hesitant to say it's just the individual, because um, it's, it's this involves repeated use within a certain uh, context or environment. It sounds like that's getting at neural networks. I mean, and there, I mean, something that I do think Hammer and I'll be get dangerously yeah. close to, and Desessa I mean, did as well. This may be, it may be both individual, but a matter of uh, choice versus uh, habitual. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. Habitual is neural network. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll follow this up. I mean, it, it, I think it might matter for your work. I think it might. Uh, That's a good question. But, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, different ways in which, for example, an instructor might uh, develop uh, beliefs about um, So I have a question. Yeah, um, because I've always thought of beliefs as being inherently unstable. You know, if you, I mean, where, like, sometimes you can ask someone about a belief and they'll give you yeah. one answer, and then you can ask them again under what seems to be the same circumstances and they'll give you a different answer. Right. Where would that fall in this? I mean, like, sometimes whatever it is that's stable is so nebulous that you can't even begin to understand it or measure it or recognize it or. Right. So, um, I, I think that's sort of what this is getting at, which is that, um, Stability, it's only stable within a particular, uh, um, depending on when or where you 
observing. So, some things are, but other things, I mean, say, really robust. We have beliefs about, like, good and evil, about who's important, you but know, in our good lives. Good and evil is very, I mean, if you ask people about that, they'll, they can be very fickle about it, you know? They can, but, I mean, anyway, the point is, is we do have some level of coherence in our lives and ways of, um, that, uh, of looking at things that are fairly stable. And often, for instance, schooling would be one of them, I think, with students, which is to say, what's my role here? in school, I think, and it, it does depend on uh, variation, but I, I don't want to throw out the ba baby with the bathwater in this and say that it, it, there, there's nothing there, it's always emergent, right? That, that would just be my caution. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's certain big ones that, you know, people are pretty consistent about, but in general, they can be pretty inconsistent, so, like, I, I mean, I found beliefs aren't very logical for people that they... One of the difficulties with Ben's study, and maybe we're but abutting this, which is using the word beliefs. In the first place. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, this is my attempt to sort of get away with that while tying it back to, you know, complete, without completely invalidating everything I've uh, done up to this point. Um, so, I mean, I, can you go back to that just real quickly? Sure. Um, the, the slide? So, our, I, I, let me just make sure I understand what this is saying then. Yeah. Um, kind of back to Melissa's point. Is it saying beliefs? Um, reflect stability in these three mechanisms. That these three mechanisms. These th are that mechanisms we can define by a belief which as, a, as a stable set of resources in which these mechanisms are stably at play. Th these are uh, mechanisms by which uh, certain networks of resources. These are um, resources that may be activated um, in the same when using the same type of framing in an environment. These are three mechanisms by which um, stability develops in that network, and that might become what we might call open. Okay, that's fine, I'm okay. I don't have to agree with um, Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm now kind of nudging toward uh, the setup for the video. Uh, but I'd like to talk about particular behaviors we might look for in these environments that may be indicative of a particular um, framing on the part of, uh, mostly this is going to be on the part of the instructor, but without forgetting that um, uh, the students are involved in uh, framing this activity as well. Uh, so the first uh, will be verbal um, behaviors, um, starting with types of questioning. So in previous talks, I've kind of enumerated different levels of questioning that I might, might identify where's a possible question the TA might ask. Um, issuing directions uh, to do something to students. Uh, so write this down, or I uh, want you to do this question first and then come back and think about this one. Or don't go on until we check in this part with me. Other types of statements. Uh, here's one I lifted from a video. Just have you guys been watching the Olympics? When the Winter Olympics are going on. This TA uh, talks about how figure skaters, uh, a particular commentator talking about how figure skaters um, adjust their rate of rotation by pulling their arms in and out, um, which is kind of an interesting combination of uh, this kind of colloquial discussion about um, things outside going on in the world outside of physics, but also tying in uh, uh, physics. And there's also um, nonverbal uh, behaviors, such as gestures. So um, up here, I've got a TA pointing with a pencil at a student's tutorial book. Uh, it could be indicating a particular response or a question in the book. Um, here's a TA giving a double thumbs up when a student gives a response he liked. Um, here we've got a TA using his hands in a gesture illustrative gesture in particular, I think it's two forces or two cards or something. And it could also be uh, posture. Uh, we've got a TA leaning over the table to look at what everybody has written down for a question before engaging with them. This is actually a common um, uh, posture for him to assume before choosing to engage verbally with the group is to come and see what everybody had written down first. 
for deciding what to say and what to ask. Um, here at TA is pulled up a desk uh, so you can sit down at the same level as the students. Um, these are types of behaviors we might look for um, or look for patterns of behavior that are indicative of a particular um, of a TA's framing of a particular uh, activity. Um, so I'd like to show you a video of a TA engaging with a group of students. Um, I have a printout of the dialogue here. And um, I'd like to have you guys uh, watch through. I'll crank the sound up so everybody can hear. And um, I'd like to kind of do kind of a group analysis at the end. Um, so as you're watching, think about um, how is the teaching assistant framing this activity? Uh, what are we noticing in his behavior uh, that's indicative of that particular frame? Um, maybe what, what's the, what are the students? Uh, is, it, is there a mismatch between their framing and the TA's framing? And um, at the end, I'll kind of wrap up with my thoughts and bring it back around to how this TA particularly talked about his teaching in an interview. So let's, uh, let's crank it up. Getting the right answers then? into the book is what you said. Is that yeah, right? Specifically, it, getting it into the book. Right. The focus is, yeah, do they have it right? right it tells them to it's start writing right. now. Okay. Right. And it's on the right answers, too. Yeah. According to it seems to be on adopting a particular procedure that he has in mind for the follow up. Okay. The questions, the questions that he is asking, he is asking are very. 
Okay. I, I found this point very compelling to follow up on, on Kathy. Line 17, it's almost as though it's blown off. So the student's trying to reconcile a very different way of looking at yeah. force. A work. Work. Yes. And you got to go to the posture, too, because somewhere in the middle of that, he goes from hands and pockets to... Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so there's, there's little, you know, uh, again, the posture of things. This is all, each TA is kind of a different stance, um, depending on whether they're waiting for a response or waiting for students to do something, or if they are um, have their hands in their pockets till they need to illustrate something. Yeah. Um, so I feel like in, but so like in line six, I mean, the student directly asks them, so would, would it be, would the network be less, and in this one, it's like, kind of ask them a yes or no question. So like, if you're kind of the TA, and unless you're, like really like trying to be looking for something different. Like they, they ask you a yes or no question, and he actually responds with like a, a general question about what is network. And right. it seems like at that point, like right. the discussion was kind of going towards understanding. Even yeah. though the student just asked for an answer, they just wanted to write it. Right. What, what line are you? Uh, uh, line, line six. Line the student six. says, "So would the would, it, would the network be less than this one?" He's asking a direct yes or no. And rather so rather than answering that, um. What time is that? Let, let, let me play on this also. I mean, I found this fascinating. This, this process was initiated by the students, sort of. But it already struck me that this, their roles had already been identified as to what's going on here. So that the students, the students were, as, as Ben's pointing out, were asking, at some level the students knew I mean, who knows who guided it and structured how it began, perhaps. But the students knew that their role was to get the right answer. They couldn't get the right answer. They stopped and they asked a question that was very explicit. So what would um, the network be less, you know, in this one, on line six? The students stopped the TA. They saw his role as giving the answer. And the TA comes over. And I do take Ben's point, which is he didn't say, yep, and moved on, right down, you know, yes, larger. But I think, you know, as we found out, I mean, Tara's point, I mean, it's very clear that the overall framing of this was one of answers. How do you, what makes you, what evidence do you have that the students were looking for an answer and not an understanding? They initiated the um, question, TA's walking around. So they asked the, the students, TA a question. Yes. And that's not evidence for either but, of those two but things. But it's not a why or a how, it's just a yes or no question. Okay, I mean, where, where is the question? Let me see. Line six. Line six. Would it be less than this one? I mean, you could just answer that as yes or no. You know, it's not a how does this work. Or we, why is that is a high inference. You guys, well, both well, of you. Well, that is a really high inference that, that the students were looking for an answer. They're asking for discourse about yeah. this problem. And this is the way they entered into the discourse. I know, and that's the way the TA responded. I mean, so the, but yeah. the question is, this is what the TA hears in real time. And, you know, like, I mean, the TA is a person, too, not a, not a supercomputer TA. And so they hear that, and they don't think about all possible answers. You just think it's a yes or no question. But I that, give a yes or no answer. So that's a given thing that know what Noah said. Noah made a claim about the student's framing. Yeah. You're making a, 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 a claim about the TA's framing. And in I fact, think those the are just very different, different things there. Yeah. And I, yes, and I think actually though that there's, you know, the students are sort of mixed here. Student one is trying to do more sense-making reasoning, or at least reconcile this particular framing with another. That's line 17 yeah. and 19, I think. Yeah, we're not sure what the students are up to. I just don't think there's enough evidence to make any claims about what the students want. Right. But, but I do think there's evidence to claim about how the TA heard what the student, what, how, what he thinks the well, students want. Yeah. Right. And I think you guys identified the critical point where it happens right after line, like basically line seven, I, where the TA. I would argue that the TA didn't hear what the students wanted to hear, what he wanted to hear. Yeah. Well, we have no idea what the students want. Right. 
but yeah. I think who cares what the students want? Well, no, but I mean that's right. I agree with that. But I think I think the TA, you know, in terms of framing, is I'm the disseminator of information. They've asked me a question. You know, a question has been posed. I don't really know what it is they're asking me. But my first response is, let's ask for the definition. Okay. Then let me recite a procedure to you instead of what is it you really are asking me with this question. Okay. And I think that's I, what's I, missing. I'll I'll I, I yeah. Do we have well, that information? Like, what have, were the students talking about before? This? Were they having I don't have it here. I haven't looked at it recently. But, uh, this right. is the last, uh, I guess I didn't give context, but this is the very last question of the tutorial um, okay. where they've done, they, they're, this is force and uh, or work in kinetic energy tutorials where they've, they've looked at two blocks being pushed together. Um, and seeing the work equals delta Ke. At the end, they're presented with an alternate situation with two blocks with a spring in between, where suddenly the work kinetic energy uh, theorem doesn't hold. Um, and so they're asked to compare this situation. How is the work done in this situation compared to the one in the previous page without the spring? I love, I, I think we're getting to a good point, which is we don't know so much about the students. We can make more inferences about the TA. Uh, there is some question about how much do we need to know about the student side, although you have more than you did before. I love line 16. I mean, it's so compelling to me in your transcription. It's something also new that we haven't looked at before, which is sort of gesture and posture. To fold your arms and then look over what somebody's writing right. is such, again, it's an inference. It can be taken in many different modes. It could be me participatory. It could be me trying to make sense of what it is that you're thinking. It sure strikes me in this instance that this is a judgmental frame. Are you yeah. doing what I told you to do? I mean, that's the way I read it. He wasn't folding his arms to get, get warm or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I would be able to see the difference in watching between right. somebody who's folding his arms because it's cold in the room and somebody who's okay. Right. That's the way. And this is one of those things that isn't, you know, I, I, I don't think the TA may, you know, uh, consciously did this to make sure they're on task. Yeah. It's a, it it's, comes it's along with this ring. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, it comes along with the command, you know, write that down, and you know, I'm going to wait and make sure that uh, you wrote down what I want you. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a. Uh, I think line seven where I. I think he's making a decision about, you know, how far back to um, start the discussion and, and decides to start with, well, let's talk about the definition of what meant work. Are you studying how coherent and consistent these bones, these frames are for given individuals? Because their, their pedagogical thinking is in pieces, too. And so, the extent to which this TA adopts this mode. Right. So one thing we might look for is whether yeah. um, this type of verbal and nonverbal yeah. behavior um, occurs repeatedly in different, you know, in different sections or with different groups. Um, if this is just kind of a default mode that the TA goes to, into, or whether it's triggered by particular types of. I mean, it's just like so right. huge, it's huge, so huge. And that would give us more idea if it is a response to what the students are saying or if it's just a default. Here's here's a good, you know, here's what seemed to have worked in the past, so I'm going to go back. To go back to the slide a couple back, that's yeah. where I think the difference between the contextual and structural is. Is the contextual is, would be, right. let me ask a clarifying, for the TA to ask a clarifying right. question. You know, what, what is it that you're really asking me in dealing with the context of is it the is it sensitive to not only the environmental structure but the student you know, the immediate uh, student uh, uh, responses are you ready to a structuralist to go back to the basic you know I have to start at point A and go through point C and D you know to make sure that I'm getting the right answer that I want to yeah I just looked at the paper because that's what the internet does for us. And they, in fact, argue that both contextual and deliberate ultimately over time can become structural. So 
so that in, in the sense of compiling resources and, and so it's what would be a coordination class or a concept or a neural network that's or a neural, neural network. They, that that's, they yeah. can't deny it. Um, structures are built out of context. Over time, right. So anyway, which yes. So we're building. Um, okay. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about since I had the uh, opportunity to talk to this TA after the semester about his own teaching, I'll just bring up a few things, uh, some snippets from that that are pertinent to this clip. First of all, um, in the intersection, um, resources that are emerging in both classroom and interim environment were um, the need to start from scratch when interacting with students and evaluating a step-by-step -step thought process. So here's this TA talking about teaching, saying, I'll, go, I'll, I'll start from scratch. If they know it, it's fine, because it won't take very long. But the ones who don't know uh, will, will benefit. Um, if I go from scratch, and then I think this is just talking about enumerating step by step, tuck, 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 tuck. And then when I get to a point that they've just reached, or this is kind of what they, this is the, here is what they were originally asking me about, then I slow it up. So, um, in an interview context, this TA is talking about this. Is, it's indicative that this is something he does regularly at values, and it's useful for him even when uh, students are asking about something new. Is to go back, you know, rewind and come up back up to that point. Yeah. I have a question. I don't know if it's really related, but where did this TA go to school? Was it in India? Uh, I was. Uh, so we talked a little bit. Part of the interview a couple of minutes just talking about the difference between um, the educational system in India and, and in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so, right, the, the, the you see one possible influence that's maybe different from this TA than for others in the same course. Um, I mean, there's the old Steve Pollock story where he found himself teaching, I'm going to, because he's not here, we can't make fun of him, no, he's kidding. But where he found himself teaching an upper division physics course with only five students. And he says, and I knew I could do some really cool interactive stuff. This was back in the day. And I said, so what did you do? And he says, I lectured. I didn't know what else to do. And he says, I lectured. These. And I, the whole time I was doing it, I knew there, was an, there must be another way, but I didn't know what else to do. Right. I mean, it seems like this, this TA idea to start from scratch and do the step-by-step -step thing is like just the standard like physics lectures are full of derivation. From mm -hmm. like A to B. I mean, right. it seems like what was the most comfortable to me as an undergrad. Right. The, and so. and elsewhere in the interview, he talks about the type of you know, how does he know that students are learning? Well, I could see them in the help room and be able to solve more and more physics problems. So yeah. there's a particular type of physics knowledge that he values, and it is the sort of step by step well, procedural so based um, type of knowledge. An extreme example of that is famous. start at top left corner of the giant blackboards at the beginning of the period, and he would, at the very last minute, he would be down on the bottom right. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I was that. I, I, and that was I that bought, that was bought at, by the MIT graduate students. Right. So generations, this was their model. Oh, right. Beautiful. Yeah. The perfect lecture. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this kind of, that comes back to... And then they propagated that out into right. the community because the part part was like that. Right. Yeah, so this kind of comes back to my intro, which is that where where if these uh, graduate students learn about what it means to know physics and what learning physics entails, it's from the environments that they've succeeded in uh, to, get the, to get to see you. Um, and they're the ones that rose to the top, you know, whether it was you know, direct <laughs> lecturing or uh, memorizing formulas out of a book. Which means it's the environment that was prevalent, or the environment that they had. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that, yep. I mean, that's an important right. little seemingly insignificant detail. Right, and, it's, and I think it's one that we don't always, uh, aren't always attentive to. Um, that was a nice example. From the, uh, this is from interview, uh, so here's the 
here is going to be an interesting point, which is uh, this TA brought up um, waiting and letting students talk before stepping in as an instructor, which wasn't really reflected uh, in his instructional practices, uh, which he was Except actually it stepping in. It's like he's tried to do that at the beginning. That's what I saw. Right. The way I saw it, again, inferring probably the orders of magnitude to the from this data, it was like there was this trend, there was this phase transition at line eight, line nine, where he fell into right. his comfort zone. Yeah. But was maybe, maybe trying to do something a little different well, at the beginning. Right. Part so. Uh, oh, wow. There was a pause. Was it? There was a pause there. There was a pause. And then he started talking. <laughs> right. Well, and that's then, interesting. Then, I mean, that, that's interesting. Right. Um, so it, it, you know, we, what we might wonder from this is exactly what, what it means to wait and how long and, and how long one lets. Um, I think in the interview I actually talked about exactly, yeah, because we actually watched, this is one where I showed him a clip of a TA with students and he said that, no, you should wait, but not that long. Um, and then you've got to step in and, and summarize summarize the discussion. So um, indicative to me that um, we need to know more than what the instructor says, you know, to, to provide, provide context for a statement like this. But also there's tension between um, particular uh, resources that we might learn from in an interview context. That is, I want to let students talk, but I also want to model my own uh, reasoning and understanding for them. Uh, so there's a tension between how long do I wait and how long do I, how long do I talk for? Um, yeah, and maybe that's what we're um, yeah. There's, you know, and I'm just making some assumptions here, but they've gone through some kind of training, right, where you've tried to put into them these ideas mm -hmm. of don't threaten the students' questions that's and get them discussing. That. And that's interesting because um, we have a crash course as part of orientation at the beginning of the fall semester. This is a spring semester, and this is not a physics TA. He was brought in from the engineering department, oh, so he was not mm -hmm. part of. Uh, he wasn't. He wasn't trained in the same way that many. I was going to say what it strikes me as someone who might be somewhat transitional in their beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, he had one belief, and now he's encountered these new ideas, and he kind of agrees with it, but he right. hasn't quite figured out how to make his practice. I and mean, we've seen that in our faculty interviews. There's this right. misalign between sometimes what they want to have happen and what they do because they haven't sorted out, exactly. you know, and they've got conflicting beliefs and it all comes out in this Well, and there are way. structural features of the environment yeah. that challenge those right. beliefs. So not only do you have conflicting beliefs and you're trying to sort them out, but at the same time, those people who are newer to an environment, uh, newer to ideas and approaches are going to be more challenged by harsh environments for implementing or, them. Just like, like, like even more lightly is um, the environment itself you you this is where uh, okay so we've talked about environmental conditioning but also so, so biological conditioning because you walk up and you try to ask them and then it's like oh god this is so uncomfortable i really am un it's so uncomfortable you guys have all done it and then you just like <gasps> you revert to what's comfortable and we do that not just in situations like that in right. every situation and then you just start doing what's comfortable and oh my god that's it it's what he knows how to do he knows how to solve problems so the guy starts solving the problem right. and it's almost like there's a biological little factor that is contextual which generated resources which were all of his problem solving but yeah, boom, there they come right. and no we're dis it, it, discomfort we all know causes you to do very strange and irrational things and that you already know how to do yeah and TAs will talk about that too there's another TA you would talk about it was hard coming up and forming a dialogue with students at first because I was, you know, Karen said I was shy or wasn't, you know, used to approaching people like that, but as the semester went on, I got better. And seeing people discomfortable, like it's hard to watch people struggle because you want to help them, and, right. and it's natural yeah. for us to, instead of to let them sit there and not know, we just like, Bleh. But it, But another part of that is for people frustration is valuable. That's, that's the tough ones. And then once you do that, and even if you know that, that's where you like believe it's valuable, but then you can't pull it off. Okay.
Yeah, um, so just to, just to finish this, this up. Interesting so, stuff, sorry. Um, something, something else I observed, just to put one in the bin, I noticed from the um, transcript here that didn't come up when talking to this teacher. Um, I noticed in line five, he's very, you know, when, when a student mentions net, net work, he's quick to correct and say network by external forces. And the student is saying, yeah, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, this is a point, you know, using particular uh, precise uh, physics terminology is something that, from his teaching, um, his TA values, but didn't come up in the context. So, so would you say you can determine his use of precise terminology? Like you can sort of measure it to the point where you can say his is more precise than another. <laughs> like, I can I can measure his terminology precision to three significant figures. No, yeah. I, I mean, can you see like a qualitative difference between you know like TAs in terms of? Well, uh, the, actually, the more common. Um, uh, let's see. There isn't. This actually came up more commonly than other TAs, and they they had more. These and this is actually something that came up in the interview for other TAs. Was talking about when students um, don't use the right term, or they say um, charge instead of field. Um, I I have to step in and correct that because you know being being a physicist means you're using you communicating using the common language, and so they would talk about how they would you know correct them spoken class, or if they use the wrong word on homework, they write in uh, field, not charge. Well, to give me an example, yeah. um, one of the things that I saw all the time was charge being used imprecisely. Because if okay. you talk about field, right. charges experience field or charges right. data field. Just talking about charge and field, right. can there be a lot of maybe conceptions, whatever you're talking about, right. that unless you tease that out from what the student is saying. Right. So some of these may have more um, uh, embedded uh, sort of content than others, and some of them may be more along the line of, well, this is just the more common, uh, this is the way physics, uh, physicists talk about it. Another perfect example is yeah. F equals MA. It isn't really F equals Right. Yeah, you know, and that's another decision that instructions the environment have to make is, you know, is do I step in and do I always step in and correct that when I hear that, or is it based on the context, or um, is it you know, just letting people use the language that is helpful for them? So anyway, that was, that's another kind of theme that uh, appeared here and um, in other TAs you talked to. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap it up here. Um, I can't remember the last time I finished uh, the term to spare. But um, just uh, in about eight or so minutes we've got left. Um, they, so I've kind of been introducing some new uh, transitionary terminology here, uh, kind of a new way of uh, presenting this rather than just talking about beliefs people have, but that um, they're sensitive to uh, local context and may become more structured over time. That's one thing we can look for. Um, is this uh, interesting? Does it seem like it's telling a story here? Um, and uh, is there anything that's kind of missing that would be interesting to consider? Um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd love for you to let me know. Thank you. Nice. Very nice. Interesting data. I, I, I have a, yeah. so you just said something that just freaked me out. Oh, um, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, um, I know, it's like I've, I've been so good. Um, okay, you just said they're sensitive to context and may become more structured over time. So, I mean, that like in coordination classes that oh. we say the concept becomes invariant. However, with teaching, I think that what, what Karen and I have talked about a lot, and certainly Bud with his work with Fasky is, right that the sophisticated teachers are exactly the ones who have evolved to being sensitive to context. <laughs> right. Maybe. Yeah. So it's an interesting I think, we, just to play on that a little bit, I mean, this is also what Chris Keller found and Chandra found, 
um, in looking at variation of, in, in faculty's practices. And we found the novice faculty, we didn't actually know where they lay. They would either, you know, always do this with clickers or always do that with yeah. clickers, but they always did the same thing. And we found the more sophisticated faculty, as defined arbitrarily by me, um, not entirely. Um, well, Brad's got the same definition. Right, well, well but... Exactly. No, no. Scale of right. Um, no, but th those who had more experience, those who were more uh, PER savvy, um, engaged in broader variation. And that also is consistent with the idea of having, you know, well, epistemological exactly toolkits. Right. Um, right, that you engage in and pulling out the right tool at the right time. Um, yeah. So, so it's, a, it's an interesting, so that might be where the resources framework might get you in trouble if you stick it inside the head of the individual, yeah. then you're going to get stuck with those coordination class models, which is a concept, right. um, you know, the formation of a concept, whereas this is exactly the thing that does not need to become invariant over time. So Right, and I think that's what, I didn't mean uh, structure to mean invariant, um, that more over time, more um, we might observe more complex uh, networks of behaviors and um, resources forming. And that doesn't mean that it's it's just one thing with the same thing happening all the time. But it, it can be there can be variation that is sensitive to um, local kinds that draws on stability, a stable activation of. of of how do you resources. how do you define just a tease on this then operationally here? Is it capturing what we want? I don't know what you've been putting it, but I'm going to focus on that word. Do you need then Kelly to answer Kelly's question, which is what were the students doing before the PA showed up? Um, or uh, how do you define context? Right. So um, I don't think uh, it's a matter of how uh, kind of deep we want to go. I think. We're really interested in um, how um, frames in these environments sort of shift. Then I'd want to know more about how, in the absence of a TA or an LA, the students are framing the activity on their own. And then what happens when um, an instructor comes and you know they're told to write something down while I wait and watch you do it. Um, but. I think as far as this goes, I think we just need to have a sense of what was with the nature of the activity just before um, the sort of interaction started uh, is sufficient for this model. That's my opinion. But I, go ahead. Well, one thing I was just going to ask was like, when you're trying to assess like what, what PA's framing is and what student's framing is, like, how do you do that? I mean, did, was some of that survey time just directly asking the students, like, how much do you agree with this statement about the tutorials? Like, I think it was um, just about... It was asking about um, their opinion about uh, the tutorial activity. What do you think is good about the tutorial for students? What do you wish you could change about the tutorial? So a lot okay. of it is about the tutorial. Some of it is asking them what... Um, what actually, you know, walk me through one of your sections. Mm -hmm. um, so what actually goes on um, in your sections class to the end, how do you usually start an interaction with students. Um, so some of it is particular to kind of opinions about the nature of the activity itself, but a lot of it is about, you know, what, what are you doing and attentive to, you know, during the whole section. So it's like those categories of like different ways to frame the tutorial, like those are more generated just from like interviews nope. and observations, or are those no, like categories you specifically ask about? Like, no, uh, I, those I just came up with to give with examples from that. Okay. So those are possible ways mm -hmm. somebody might choose to frame this activity in particular. Mm -hmm. They weren't coming from or shown to... Um, so those there wasn't like a list that anybody had to agree or disagree with. Okay. It was just for examples. Hey. Uh, have you found or, or thought that there would be any value to just checking simple stats like the total number of interactions that TA had or the percentage of time at a table that they're speaking versus the other one for scalability? So um, I have thought about this in the past because as I was kind of calling episodes and just noticing differences in how long uh, teachers stayed at a table, it is one thing that we could look at in terms of uh, 
Um, and it would tell us something. I mean, you'd have to adjust for um, how long they're spending relative to the number of you know, tables there are in the section. But it does give you a sense of um, uh, coming back to that framing, um, how long the instructor chooses to stay gives you an idea of, well, what's the goal of this particular interaction right now? Is there, am I waiting for something to happen or am I just getting them going on something and then I can leave? Am I checking through an entire page of the tutorial? And um, you do notice differences. I haven't gone through and crunched. I've kind of been interested to do that just to see on average who's spending longer at a table. Um, I think it gives you some supplementary uh, information on what, what the point of actually interacting with a group of students is. I, I also think talk time, or a fraction of the time speaking, be speaking right. when. Yes. Um, right, those might be some simple, simple statistics that might correlate with other things. Um, so, because this this makes sense, this framework. So, the no, the idea is then that the that the TA is framing the situation in some way, and that framing bears on what resources of their uh, set are, are activated. Domain of, of resources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and which ones are activated as they as the session would say read out from the from the situation. Right which ones are, are brought to bear. Um, but um, so, so, yeah, I really hope that you get into beyond the cognitive yeah. zone right. where, where those, there are human beings interacting with people, drawing right. on resources that go far beyond just teaching resources. They, they have to do with feeling resources and things that cause us to behave in ways that yeah. we behave. And so... I think one of the biggest problems with the resources framework is that they always, oh, they do epistemological and ontological resources as well, but always build on the rational elements of our choice making rather yeah. than the irrational elements of our choice making and how those resources come to bear on the behaviors that ultimately take place. I think that's a great point. Um, I think that's something I'll have to think about going forward. Yeah. Teaching is an uncomfortable thing, man. Right. And you know, one thing, I, one point I want to avoid making is that this is just some mechanistic, completely mechanistic, causal model. Um, that this is way, you know, teacher thinks this way, this is what they're going to do because that's not the way I think about it myself. And the other thing I hope you can avoid is that what I've seen people do a lot of is. Um, use resources instead of something be like beliefs or right. instead of some other thing for the sole purpose of dealing with contextual variation. And that's like almost like, oh, there's contextual variation. It must be resources. And that without a very nice elaboration of why resources are the thing you're going to decide to use yeah. for contextual variation. clips in the past, we never got to the second one, so I... Uh, Thank God you didn't, we wouldn't be done yet. <laughs> yeah, so I think, yeah, once this is more fleshed out, that's definitely uh, something I think would be valuable. Because then you, then it's easier to answer that second question, is it capturing what you want? Are right. You seeing are are there differences in that? Right? That's the, that's the big enchilada there. Awesome. Thanks, Ben.